as multidimensional beings, we are spirit having a human experience. We are divine. We are eternal. We are already perfect, even if we just forgot. Right. Right. But when we aren't aligned in that remembrance of who we are, and we're coming from a fear-based consciousness or fear-dominant life, it creates imbalances and blocks within our energetic bodies. Mm -hmm. And as you're shifting to a more heart-centered space or energy, there is a process of healing and detoxifying. It's just like if you were to do uh, an herbal cleanse or an herbal detox or on a physical level, you're going to feel awful for a period of time as you're clearing away that the toxins from the body and you're releasing all this um, stuff from your body. Well, there is a similar experience energetically, emotionally that we go through as we hold more and more of this frequency and it opens up the chakras and it opens up our energetic system. When you say yeah. that's part of the healing path that so many people are going through trying to reconnect. It's like, as you reconnect, you're like, I'm doing the right things. I'm going, I'm trying to get in the right direction, but I'm going through all this emotional release and heaviness and challenges. And yeah, it's, it's because you are literally shifting frequency and it's purging or it's bringing those energies up to the surface Yeah, to say, okay, well, what did you learn from this experience? Where are the diamonds? Absolutely. And I think kind of going into that space is even going back to when we do step into living a heart-centered life, it almost does create this space of shifting that energy and being aware of it. But I mm -hmm. think a great way to also go into that is with a childlike innocence. Yes. Is a sense of playfulness is because we can do so much inner child work, inner healing. But what I found the most effective is when I give myself permission mm -hmm. to explore what I loved when I was a child, because I might have, a, it's kind of like, okay, if you remember going to some park when you were little and it was like the biggest park you've ever been to, and you couldn't even imagine going to any other park because it was so big. And then you go there as an adult and you're like, this park is so tiny. <laughs> Why did I think this was so huge? Yeah. That's how it is with our life. Is sometimes we need to go back and to explore that, but almost give it a freshness of eyes in a playful way so that we're not stuck in this heavy muck all of the time where yes, sometimes it's great to be there. But I think also just as much as feeling those heavy things, if we add play and lightheartedness to that space, we're going to heal so much quicker because we're working at a higher frequency. Totally. And a lot of times, you know, our habits as humans is that we want to understand everything. everything and we want to know like, why is this still bugging me? Why is this returning to my life? And they, we kind of, we shift from a heart energy into a judgmental ego centered energy. Yes. And wisdom you are the embodiment. We are the embodiment of wisdom. We don't have to go chase wisdom to have that whole idea of like judgment is like, oh, I have to go get it. It's something outside of myself. And that is an illusion because as you discover through time, that wisdom is you. That is you. Mm -hmm. That is your true identity. It actually comes to the surface naturally. You don't have to make it happen. And I, what I love what you said too, is that this innocence is so important because if you can come to whatever you're feeling and be raw and fully feel what you're feeling, but approach it with curiosity instead of judgment, like, Hmm, what is this about? Yeah. And give your soul full permission to really feel into that energy without judging then you have, then what happens is that energy or that wisdom and that experience, you're able to retrieve those diamonds or those energies of wisdom that will just kind of come up to the surface naturally without you having to push or make it happen. Yes. And then also rediscovering this 
childlike awe and innocence within yourself, how to play again, because connecting in with that energy, you think about it when you were a child or you look at children who are toddlers, you know, they scream, they'll have their tantrum, they go through their tantrum phases, but they're so present that they fully feel it. And within 10 minutes, they could be playing and laughing like nothing ever happened. Yeah, it, they allow that forget. energy and they're quick to forget. Yeah. They just allow the energy to move through them without judgment. And they're able to learn from that experience quicker that, oh, if I do this or do that, it doesn't get me what I want. I, there's other ways to achieve my goals mm -hmm. without throwing a fit or doing this or X, Y, and Z but they fully feel that emotion. And then they're able to retrieve the diamonds from that experience and move on and get on with it, you know, be able to, to bring in that presence yeah. and that playfulness because joy is the highest frequency in the universe. But a lot of people feel that joy should just happen and I should just feel joyful and spiritual and it should happen spontaneously. But what I have found in the heart centered life is that happiness and joy had to be cultivated Absolutely. first in order to really clear out that space and open up that where it became more of a permanent state. What does that feel like or what does that look like living in a more heart-centered life? And how can we make those steps to make it happen? Mm -hmm. Because going back to being in the Aquarian age is it's all about going into that heart center and living life that's true to you. Mm -hmm. And that can be an amazing concept to talk about, but how do we integrate that into our space? So it's more of our everyday experience versus just a foreign concept. Yes. And I think the first is that reconnection into our playful inner child you know, what things bring us joy and, and making time for that in our busy lives, which is not easy to do, but at the same time it is possible. And it's having play time just for the sake of play without agenda. And this is what adults, they have such a habit of doing this because they'll start playing and they'll say, oh, I wonder if I could market this. I wonder, like, like for example, um, That's so true. I would. Be, okay, I'm going to make jewelry. That was one of the first things I did when I reconnected with my creativity. It's like I love. I would love to make my own jewelry. Let's see if I can do it. And so I started making my own earrings and bracelets and necklaces and things like that. And then all of a sudden, I started my energy started squeezing in because, and my heart started closing up because then I started thinking about, well, if it's not good enough to sell. And if I you know, like, could I make this marketable? And then I started putting a pressure on myself where it shifted the energy Then it wasn't play anymore. Yeah. Then I started bringing in that perfectionism energy and judging myself and my work. And then what did I do? I stopped making jewelry. Yeah. Right. This is what so many people do. It doesn't matter if you're writing, if you're making jewelry, if you're taking a dance class, if you're whatever, right? Yeah. It's this almost, is such a habit of people. Yeah. It's almost like we put that pressure on it or we put that like adulting mm -hmm. into the space where if it's not going to serve someone or if it's not going to make us money, then we can't do it. We don't give ourselves permission almost at yeah. a certain point, right? Yeah. Yeah. When we give ourselves permission to play, it gives ourselves literally permission to actually experience the world, Exactly. to experience what life is about. Because yes, having those worldly things of finances is definitely needful mm -hmm. to live a good, comfortable life, but it's almost like we over-identify with the physical aspects of the world that we almost separate ourselves from filling our spirit mm -hmm. because we're so focused on the world. So it's like finding that balance, but even giving ourselves permission to play is a huge thing. I know another one that I really, uh, that helped me reconnect was uh, that I tried and I loved it was again, dancing or sacred movement. The reason I loved and the difference between sacred dance or ecstatic movement and regular dance is that ecstatic dance or sacred movement is when you put on music and you dance like no one is looking, right? It's the crazy woman dance. It's yeah. where your full body, you're just feeling into it. And I remember I would feel, I would never do this in front of anyone else in the beginning. I eventually I ended up teaching workshops on it 
But in the beginning, I was like, I'm just going to dance. And I, so I would go in at night when the kids were asleep and Jeff was downstairs and I dim the lights. I make sure I lock the door. So nobody make walk sure in. Alone. Yeah. <laughs> make sure I was alone. Light my <laughs> candle, create some sacred space energy. And then I would move. And then I realized in that movement that I was releasing uh, not only blocks, but I felt like I was releasing, I mean, attention, but I felt like I was releasing energy blocks or I would end up crying. Wow. And I would end up going into these feelings of altered state of consciousness, like leaving my body or not feeling the edges of my body. Interesting. And I got it, you know, just like how the Native Americans, you know, did sacred ceremony around the fire. And this is something that is so rooted within our being to do. And yet we've conditioned it so much in our society that if it's not the salsa or if it's not this or a ballet and you don't do these moves, don't do it perfect, that that is not real dancing. And a lot of people judge themselves and they cut themselves off from the opportunity of really reconnecting into the present moment and releasing those energy blocks from their bodies and reconnecting with that inner child heart energy. That's so good. Within themselves. I just like want to soak in all of that because it brings in this this place of we are here to be spiritual and to be, and to be physical where I feel like there's, it's easy to have a difference or a connection diversion from both of those things. And so even experiencing that sacred movement, like really, I grew up dancing so I can totally see the perfectionist side. And when I did that, I was Mm. like, I can't be perfect at this. I don't want to do it. So it almost like helps me want to retry that in mm-hmm. a way of like grace and of love instead of like harshness. Yes. So that's something that I feel like I could definitely give myself permission to do. Yeah. And have fun with it. Another thing I think is really important is discovering some kind of um, creation, something that you can create from within, whether that's music or drawing or journaling or writing or maybe it's creating like a model car or something that you can physically give your mental mind an outlet in creating. It almost gives you permission to connect to your spirit. Mm -hmm. And I like to describe this like when I'm channeling is we have the right side of our brain, which is the free flowing. It's the creative, it's the spiritual. And the left side is a lot more of the analytical. Mm -hmm. It questions things, it gets things done. So in life, we want to have a balance of both, but how many times do we live in more of that physical, get things done, have a list of things versus having the flow of creation. And so it's almost like when we can give our left brain something to do, whether it's jewelry or whether it's a model car or it's painting or it's paint by number, it's like we're giving our left brain something to focus on. So our spirit can actually make contact with our heart. So we can receive that answer. We can receive that guidance. And it might be like, Hey, I'm trying this. And then in the middle of doing that, I'm like, I want to try this or this or this. And it's giving ourselves permission for our spirit to say, Hey, connect back into your heart. What else do you want to try? Well, I want to try this. Okay. Now what I want to try this. And then what this, and before you know it, you have like five things that you've tried. Maybe you didn't like some, maybe you like some, but you've given yourself permission to explore and to actually do what you came here to do, which is to experience life yes. in your heart center. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I love too how you mentioned you're not just here to be a physical, but you are to be spiritual. You're here to be both. both. And this is going back to the point that in this Aquarian age, my feeling is that it's just, it's about that integration. It's not about saying like in the age of Pisces where I need to be either here or there, or I need to earn my way back, um, or I need to give my power outside of myself, or I'm going to heaven, or I'm going to hell, or there's like this thing where there is this disconnect yeah. And between the spiritual and the physical. And what I feel is that it's this part of this great awakening is again, coming into the realization 
that you are multidimensional, that you are spiritual, having your spirit being, having a physical experience and that there is nothing unholy about being human. Oh, I love that. There's nothing unholy about being human to believe that would mean that something holy is outside of myself, that I'm somehow disconnected from the divine within me Yeah. when the divine is is moving through every molecule I was gonna say of lives, your being. It lives within you. It lives within you. It's everywhere. It's yeah. on the chair that we're sitting on. It's the person we're speaking to. There's no separation okay. of that which is holy and that which is human. I love that. I just want to like hold that in my space. Is like, there's, what did you say? Not being holy. Say that again. There is nothing unholy about being human. Just like sit with that for a minute. Like that is so powerful. And it's almost like the Aquarian age is also having us shed beliefs that don't serve us Mm -hmm. in our body is bad. I have to have someone give me revelation for myself. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like we're really being called to turn within to find our truth. I'm like, how powerful is that? Like, and we have the answers within. We don't need to go somewhere else to receive it. However, we can look towards people as guidance, but I find But they're really there just to help you remember. That's that's it. Really, it's it's about remembrance. Yes, remembering who we are, remembering our true self, because once again, we're so much more than this physical journey. Mm -hmm. There's so much to us, so much to our life. And the Aquarian age really is like pushing us to explore that opportunity and to grow. When you really feel into that energy, it it's exciting. It's exciting because you're like, oh my gosh, miracles are real and ordinary existence. And not right? only that is that if you are part of this, if this energy is in you, it's like ingrained within you, like you are a miracle. Every and second you can provide and experience miracles that you get to create. Mm-hmm. As you connect to your heart center, I always like to think that when someone's, I always talk about death, which that's what I do, <laughs> but I always talk about how scientifically we're not pronounced dead until our heart has stopped beating. Mm. So essentially our heart is that connection from spirit to the physical. So when we are connected to our heart center, we're literally connected to our physical and our spiritual selves. Mm -hmm. There's no division. It's that connection that really makes being human possible. 